Here in Malta's ancient capital of Medina, we examine the newfound prosperity of these islands. There have been three phases of Malta's economic progress. The first in antiquity, when the Phoenicians established this capital as Malif. The second in the early modern period, when Malta was ruled by the Knights of the Order of St John. And now, the platform of Malta as the smallest state in the European Union. We turn to Dr Stephanie Fabri to examine why Malta, the smallest state, has the highest growth rate in the European Union. Stephanie, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. Malta, the smallest state in the European Union, now has the fastest rate of growth in the whole of Europe. Why is that? Yes, yeah, so basically, we over the years, we managed to achieve high rates of economic growth, especially compared to other European countries. And this is despite our um, inherent disadvantages. So basically, Malta is small um, in terms of size. Uh, our population is less than half a million people. And that means that we have a limited market. And uh, we have the disadvantage of uh, insularity. Apart from that, just to put you in context on the Maltese economy, uh, we do not have any natural resources, so our main economic resource is people. So we are a service-based industry, and I believe that this is part of the uh, sort of contribution to our exceptional economic growth. Um, services generate higher output per capita. Another reason why I believe we have achieved um, high rates of economic growth is due to the influx of foreign workers that we had over the past years. So our population increased by 15 times more compared to other European so countries. So you're not just the fastest growing, but a major contributor to that is relatively a very fast growing population. Yeah. Now that must place strains on the social infrastructure of Malta as well as the economic success that Malta is enjoying. Yes, so when it comes to economic success you have the pros and the cons. The pros are the high uh, growth per capita, more employment opportunities and more investment opportunities. But the cons of the economic growth are of course the higher inflation, the environmental impact on society and on Malta in general, and of course the levels of um, inequality tend to increase with economic growth. Dr Fabri, you are a, a policy orientated economist in the Prime Minister's office before becoming an academic economist at the University of Malta. So at that time in the Prime Minister Gonzi's office, just after accession to the European Union, after the joining the Euro, did they anticipate the rapid strides at the Maltese Accord? Was this planned for or is it happen chance? Um, I think that uh, success doesn't come uh, um, easy, so it doesn't come without working hard for it. So um, it involved a lot of planning throughout the years. The previous government and the current government have worked um, endlessly to make sure that the Maltese economy grows in a sustainable way. And uh, what I think that was very beneficial in terms of generating this economic growth is that um, politicians tended to see the economy in terms of ecosystems. So when planning, politicians looked at the banking relations, so not just at the economy, the banking relations, the human talent, the legislative frameworks required, and that has led to uh, this sustainable planning has led to this growth. So I don't think it came without planning. So the higher participation in the workforce, has that led to a, a very great increase in participation of women? Uh, and is there a much... Uh, broader social spread of people who are economically active now? Yes, um, of course we are. We have a very high employment rate, in fact the um, unemployment rate in Malta is one of the uh, lowest rates in the uh, European uh, Union um, and women are uh, much more contributing to the economic growth, so there is an increase um, involvement of, of, of women in the in the working force and this is thanks to the family friendly measures that have come into force in the uh, recent years which allowed women to re-enter the labor market even after uh, having children. Now Malta since independence or since becoming a republic has had two women presidents. Uh, have you thought yourself of uh, entering public life, going into the hurly-burly of Maltese um, politics? Uh, I'm enjoying my career at the moment. I love being an economist, I love being a lecturer. Um, however, who knows, in the future, I might consider it. Well, I'll take that as a positive maybe. <laughs> and thinking more generally, if you were still policy advising the, the government, 
would you be advising them to tackle some of the social inequalities which, as you rightly say, often accompany rapid spurts of economic growth? Yes, in terms of inequality, I feel that one of the things that if I had to be a policy advisor I would promote is the idea of tackling um, the issue of early school leaving. So Malta has one of the highest rate of early school leavers. Um, basically around 50% of students stop at uh, secondary level, so they do not go into higher secondary. And I feel that this targeting, this issue, could help us in tackling even further inequality. Having said this, when it comes to inequality, we are still below the EU average, so we are in a good position. But I feel that we can come to a better situation economically if we tackle the issue of early school leaving and more family-friendly measures to help women, not just women actually, families re-enter the labour market more easily and feel comfortable to find a balance between work and life. And Dr Fabri, when, when you're lecturing and you, your <laughs> students ask you what is Malta's greatest economic asset, how do you answer that in a phrase? Without any doubt, the people, them, the students, us, it's people. Well, in order to toast uh, the Maltese pe people, I've got great pleasure in presenting you with a quake, which is <laughs> Scots Gaelic for a loving cup. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, as an economist, you'll well understand the drill. It's whiskey in the quake, only Scotch whiskey. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Doesn't work for anything else. And you pass it around, well, all your friends. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great pleasure. Thanks, pleasure yeah. here. Of course, economic success brings with it its own challenges. But the first is whether economic expansion is sustainable in this crowded island with rapid growth and population expansion. The second is, does economic progress throw out a wider disparity between the rich and the poor. And thirdly, the murder in 2017 of investigative journalist Daphne Caruana Galizia threw into sharp relief when a flood of dirty money was in danger of undermining the political fabric of the Maltese Islands. Now, for rather more than 80 years, uh, the sometimes turbulent history of, uh, of this island has been charted by the Times of Malta, the predominant English language newspaper uh, in Malta. It was bombed uh, during World War II, its offices. It was firebombed in the late 1970s. But every single day, the Times of Malta has never missed a beat, never missed an issue. I'm delighted to be joined by the editor-in-chief, uh, Herman Grech. Welcome to the Alex Allen Show. Thanks for the invitation. So over that... Uh, sometimes turbulent in 80 years, with the times of uh, Malta being the, the voice of common sense and forward-looking direction for the <laughs> island? I'm not too sure, but I, I would like to say that, yes, we were on the right side of history where it comes to certain um, important decisions. Uh, let me talk about at least my generation. You know, we fully backed EU membership when we had the referendum here in 2003, and uh, that went in favour, uh, and we eventually joined the EU. Back in the 70s and 80s, there, there were problems with two-party almost political system here and where there were a group of people linked with the Labour Party at the time that were nothing short of thugs who would not take any voices uh, of dissent. So hence your offices ended up burnt down. <laughs> yes, in 1979. Well, what's interesting is that, of course, this was not a party-sanctioned uh, you know, attack. Mm. It was just a group of thugs that, after a manifestation of the Labour Party in Valletta, where our offices used to be, they just stormed into our offices and started burning down the place, but, with, the, with the people still inside the building. Well, but things are a bit <laughs> quieter and a bit more peaceful now. Oh, yes. Maltese population has been rising quite sharply, uh, and not just uh, through the arrival of desperate refugees, <laughs> the, the arrival of... Uh, of many people who are far from desperate yeah, and extre yeah. extremely wealthy. How does the indigenous population regard this influx of, uh, of people from many nationalities but large bank balances? It it's, makes me a bit angry, actually, because I'm, I'm all for integration and I have no problem with so many people living here. I mean, the latest number is that there are about half a million people living here. Uh, when in the 60s, there were 300, 350,000. And in a small island like this, where we're practically falling over each other, you know, it's growing and growing. People are coming here because the economy is flying. I mean, we're, we're talking about the highest rate of growth uh, in, in Europe now. So the smallest country in the European Union has the highest rate of economic growth yes. in the European Union. It is good. It's also bad because it's leading to our ruin, I think, because I, um, there's a certain limit to how much you can grow. Now, the one thing we can sell and we're proud of in this country is our history. 
There's a fantastic history, but it's being overshadowed by these uh, ugly cement blocks, which we persist in, in building all for the sake of growth and so many people coming to live here. Under and what's going to happen when the bubble bursts? The arguments uh, from the, the opposition and from newspapers, uh, critics about corruption in government, is that uh, another sign or, or byproduct of economic success if there's a lot of money sloshing around in the, in the system? Is that, is that, would you put it down to that? Look, there are, there are several accusations of corruption which are very worrying, and we keep hearing this on a daily basis. The Panama Papers exposed certain senior people involved in some very dodgy business. And what happens is you, you get to a stage where now people are saying, OK, fine, those people are corrupt, but I still have money in my pocket. Um, which is quite a worrying thing to, 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 to see in, in my own country. Having said that, I mean, if you take a world index of civil liberties, uh, uh, Malta ranks very highly. I mean, Malta is up there in the, the top 20 in terms of efficiency of government, in terms of pluralism of the system, in terms of freedom of the press. So perhaps uh, it's, uh, the many other countries in the world would envy the, the degree of freedom there is in the world. Uh, to a certain extent, remember, since uh, Daphne Caruana Galizia, the journalist, was killed you know, two years ago, things have changed here. So, yes, there is the freedom of the press. We are free to report whatever we want, and I have no problem with, with that. The censorship comes in different ways. The censorship comes in me asking legitimate questions to the government and not getting any replies. Uh, but isn't that uh, what happens in, in most political systems? I mean, I've, uh, I've seen a, a parliamentary answer or two in my time and very seldom <laughs> did they yield the information. It doesn't make it right, for. though, does it? I mean, but I mean, sometimes I'm talking about uh, issues where things are in the public interest, um, where there are clear issues of nepotism, uh, about lack of accountability and even you know sometimes we're talking about serious issues you know we ask the army here about a group of migrants uh, reportedly approaching Malta and they're in distress and we're saying we're being told um, you know you've got the wrong information or it's not true while the NGOs are telling us yes there is a boat approaching Malta now I see that there, there's it's a very delicate political game we're playing okay we're playing with people's lives around the side of the of the Europe you know, unfortunately, the, this reality we're living in nowadays, where you don't care about migrants' lives, provided we can get uh, the, those populist votes. But isn't that the job of a, a newspaper to, to That's what we are shine doing. a light on these things? That's what we are doing. And the one thing which makes me proud of being a journalist in Malta is that the independent press has taken a unique stand of... of we're all pro-integration. I'm talking about the independent press here. And we really call out the government for any acts, including the blatant racism, which is growing on a daily basis here. Would you say there was any possibility whatsoever of Malta following the old colonial power of Britain out of the exit door of the European Union? No way. No way. No, it's impossible. It would be stupid. I mean, I think Britain is <laughs> stupid to walk out. Um, this is, you know, sometimes we tend to forget what the EU actually stands for with its many flaws, you know, the fact that we haven't had a single war in, in Europe since it's the EU's inception is enough of reason, especially in this day and age. Uh, I would still like to see certain things. I still think there are problems with countries like Hungary and, and even now with Italy, the way that there's right-wing rhetoric. But um, I, th I think it would be impossible for any prime minister, at least in my lifetime, to say, let's walk out of the EU. It would be suicide. Well, I, I can't tell everything about the next 80 years of the Times of Malta, but what I can do is present you with Alex Salmon Quake for appearing on the show. So you know the drill, Herman? Yeah. The whiskey and the quake, only scotch, and then round uh, the entire readership of the Times of Malta. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Here in Medina, the tourists are lapping up the delights of Malta's ancient capital. Now we ask modern-day politicians how they respond to the challenges posed by rapid economic growth and how they're going to consolidate Malta's platform as the European Union's smallest member state. And I'm delighted to be joined by Dr Byron Camilleri, who's the government whip in the, the Maltese Parliament. Byron, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you for inviting me. 
Now, economic success uh, brings with it uh, challenges, perhaps not as great as the challenges of economic failure, but challenges nonetheless. But let's take these in turn. The environment, sustainability, I mean, Malta is a highly densely populated island and has a rapidly increasing population and rapid economic development. Is that sustainable over the, the medium term? I believe that the rise of population is high, highly related to, to the economic growth. But I'd rather be here discussing with you economic growth, the challenges of economic growth, rather than the challenges or problems created by, by recession or by uh, deficit year after year, just as we had up until two, a few years ago. Before in the 1950s and 1960s, the Maltese used to, to go and live abroad to emigrate to, to the UK, to, to Australia, because they couldn't find a job here. Now other people are seeing Malta as the, the island of opportunities, so we have quite a difference there. With regards to sustainability, we are working on that. We are investing a lot in our infrastructure, both physical infrastructure and social infrastructure. For example, economic growth helps us to sustain pensions. We increased pensions year after year here in Malta. We increased financial assistance to, to people with disability. We introduced the, the free childcare. We increased the children allowance. And are these social measures uh, enough to address the growing income inequalities which often economic growth can be associated with? I believe that we are on the right track. It doesn't mean that everything is perfect, but for example, if you look at the poverty statistics, uh, you can see that poverty is decreasing year after year. So economic growth has helped us to, to sustain various measures to decrease poverty in Malta. Now, obviously, economic success can also bring challenges to a political system uh, as, because there's much more money about throughout the... Yes. And the, the Prime Minister has recently announced uh, an inquiry into the circumstances surrounding the death of a, uh, a prominent journalist, the murder of a prominent journalist. Now, people have been charged uh, with that offence. But more generally, what measures does the Maltese government intend to, to strengthen the fabric of democracy and the rule of law? We took various measures. First of all, the, the killing of a journalist is condemnable, and currently there are three persons which are facing um, criminal uh, accusations in court. We even invited the Venice Commission to come to Malta and give us their proposals. They gave us their proposals and we are implementing those proposals. We are engaging with the various institutions of the European Union and thus we are creating uh, the change that is required. We are implementing various measures to strengthen democracy and to strengthen our rule of law. Now as the, the smallest member state in the whole of the European Union, does that still allow you to have a distinctive contribution from Malta and that, that European canvas? Yes, I believe we do. We can, uh, a few months ago, we had the presidency of the European Union and we managed to change things. We managed to implement things such as the mobile excise tax, uh, which was charged when you travel to the European Union. When we look even at various other agreements, such as the migration agreement, we managed to take a leading role and we find common ground with our neighbours, with Italy, with Greece, and we managed to be even successful and have a leading role in Europe. Now, for most of that period, uh, it was a fairly tight battle in Maltese politics between the Nationalist Party and the Labour Party. Now the Labour Party are very dominant. Now, as the government whip, uh, does uh, that political dominance bring problems, or are you quite happy you're not <laughs> in a wafer-thin majority? I'm very happy to have a majority because I know that the people trust us. We have uh, the highest trust ever uh, since elections were held since independence. So we are very glad. But we keep we must keep working hard for it because you, you, you gain trust, uh, not easily, but uh, very hard, but it's easy to, to lose trust. So we must keep our feet on the ground, we must keep working, we must keep improving the people's lives. We must keep very humble and change for the better. Now, way back, uh, it was even at one time part of the Labour Party's programme uh, to have Malta integrated with Britain to have seats in the, the House of Commons. Uh, and then it chose the route of independence and, and being a republic within the Commonwealth. Is there any chance at all that people in Malta might want to follow the old colonial power of Britain out of the, the exit door of Europe? I don't believe so. I don't want to. I, don't, I want to stay in Europe.
Is there any regret in, in Malta that Britain has chosen that course, or do you just leave that <laughs> to the politicians of Westminster? I, I will leave that to our historians. I will leave that to our historians, but I'm gladly be part in the European Union. Is there any role that you can see Malta playing as being a, a bridge between Britain and the rest of the European Union, if indeed Brexit takes place? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And I believe that uh, our history connects us more. We feel at home in Britain, British feel at home here. The UK must still be our favourite partner. So should I give new Prime Minister Johnson your phone number? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, I don't know if you'll get a call from uh, Boris Johnson, uh, uh, but what I can do... I did meet him once. <laughs> good. Well, next, <laughs> next time you meet him, you can, you can give him a drink from the, the Alex Salmon Quake. Uh, th this is a, a loving cup in Scots Gaelic. You put whiskey, only Scotch only whiskey. Scotch. It doesn't work with any other <laughs> drink in the Quake, and you, you pass it around all these government MPs to keep them in line. Thanks a lot. Thank question. you for having me Thank on your show. You. Thank you. Here in uh, Castilla and Valletta, we continue our story of the progress of the Maltese economy beside the statue of Dom Mintoff, one of the architects of Maltese independence and prime minister when Malta became a republic in 1974. I'm now delighted to be joined by Silas Engela, the prime minister's advisor to the European Union. Silas, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you for having me. When uh, Malta, of course, chaired the, the, the European Council uh, as the, one of the smallest countries in the, of the 28, as it was then, that must have been a, you know, a, even a six months chairing must have demanded a huge effort of yes. people like yourself, but the whole range of the, of the political administrative uh, governance of, the, of Malta must have been devoted to that huge task look back at the presidency and then seeing it from a from an objective perspective if you see what other institutions say what other member states say that the Maltese presidency was one of the best presidencies in the terms of how many files we managed to close during our presidency the relations that we had not only within the council but with other institutions so the European Parliament for instance and the European Commission I think we were the fact that uh, this was interesting I believe the fact that our Prime Minister our Deputy Prime Minister, our Finance Minister, were all members of the European Parliament before, led to a presidency which encompassed all institutions rather than having the Council against Parliament as sometimes it is portrayed to be. We made that effort to have a one European Union, three different institutions, but working together in tandem in order to achieve results. This was in 2017. Tell me a bit about how did this have an impact on the people of Malta? I mean, the, the people say, my goodness, you know, we are now cheering Europe. But was this a, you know, a bit like winning the European Cup or, or perhaps even the Eurovision Song Contest? <laughs> I think Maltese people were proud. They were proud to see the different um, leaders, the different heads of state and government coming to Malta for two different summits uh, in the span of six months. Uh, seeing many other dignitaries from all across the globe coming to Malta, being the center of politics in Europe for those six months. That is maybe different to what we're used to because we're a small country at the periphery of the European Union. And for those months, we were actually chairing this huge block of more than 500 million people affecting the lives of each and every citizen in the European Union. And there, I think you can see how much even a small member state gains by being a member of the European Union in the sense that we used to um, be affected by laws that are, come out of the European Union. But you worked in Scotland. Uh, how do you feel for a, a European nation like Scotland, which is clearly <laughs> wants to be part of the European firm in some way, uh, but is caught in this Brexit dilemma mm. just now? I spent two years in Scotland and I loved um, being among the Scottish people. I think we have so much in common. As, uh, as citizens in Malta and, and Scotland, as we have in common with all of the United Kingdom in, in reality, which are, as I said before, a, a common past. Um, I do feel for the Scottish um, in, the quest, in their quest for independence, for instance, in their quest to have a, an independent Scotland and being a member of the European Union. Obviously, I'm not going to go into the internal politics of the United Kingdom, um, it is, uh, the dynamics are there, there are the systems uh, and the ways to hold referenda as we had uh, in the past uh, in Scotland. I remember it. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Um, I, for one, would love 
to see Scotland being a member of the European Union, as I would love the, the whole of the United Kingdom to be a member of the European Union. But I guess it is a matter that needs to be decided between the Scottish and the British uh, in general in, in your own country. We've spoken a bit about uh, what the European Union has, has been able to uh, give to Malta. What do you think that Malta has added to the, the European Union? Um, the voice of a very small country, I think that we need to move from a European Union of a one-size-fits-all mentality um, because not all member states are the same. So whilst we work together and agree together to move forward, uh, but I believe that the voice of small member states must always be heard. And I think that what Malta brought in, in the European Union family, apart from the colour, uh, maybe the noise and our... Um, vibe or Mediterranean energy. I think that we also managed to give an input um, for change at the moment as well. I see the past six years uh, of my country as being the six years of change. So we went from a situation where we had not even divorce legislation uh, seven years ago. Today we have all the civil rights and liberties. We're a country that was like a fortress holding everyone off, uh, trying to push people away to a cosmopolitan country which is embracing the future. We speak of uh, Malta being the blockchain island at the moment, the Malta of artificial intelligence, the Malta of medical cannabis, for instance, and the new sectors that are growing in our country. And we're living in a, uh, in a country which is very cosmopolitan at the moment, very multicultural. And I think that that is the way forward. And that is what we're trying to give to the European Union today as well. Uh, we're very small, but we're very determined. We want to move forward. We want to see not only us as a member state moving forward, but we want the, the whole European Union to move forward into a more progressive and a more social uh, European Union. And I think that is what we, that is our um, passion, social politics. You know, we're, apart from being a small country, we're a country that has no natural resources at all. Um, the, our only resource are the Maltese people. And I think that a government that invests in its people is a government that brings the best out of its people. And that is what we're experiencing in the past six years. We are the second country in Europe, for instance, to lower the age of voting to 16. And in the elections last May, uh, we had 16-year-olds voting for the first time and 16-year-olds putting their name up for election. And we have now a number of deputy mayors, councillors all across the country who are only 16 and 17-year-old. And that shows the trust that the Prime Minister has, the government has, and the Labour Party has in young people. Silas, thank you very much. Thank you. Me. Thank you very much. Coming up on next week's show, I speak to Dr Emmanuel Butacic of the University of Malta on the history of the Knights of St John. Anthony D'Amato of D'Amato Records, the oldest record shop in the world. And entrepreneur Andrea Mbroli on the resurgence of Valletta. From Taz and me and all it's the show, it's goodbye for now.